we do have a special group of students here with us from the APAPA Youth Chapter of Columbus. Is that right? Would you uh, kindly do us the favor of coming forward? The whole group. Bring everybody up here. Just right up here. And if you could, please, using that flag right there, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Is there a spokesman? Can we draft a spokesman for your group and maybe tell us a little bit about yourselves? And go, go to that podium right there. Make sure that microphone is on. Right in the mic. There you go. OK. Um, we are the Papa Ohio Youth Chapter, the Columbus Division. And our mission is to promote voter education and civic engagement in our community. In the past, we have held a voter education seminar and a civic leadership forum. And um, we, look in, we look forward to working with the council on future events, and we thank you for having us here today. Thank you very much, guys, for coming in. We appreciate it very much. <laughs> Under our special recognitions portion of the agenda, it's hard to believe, but evidently the Dublin Methodist Hospital is already 10 years old. So um, I believe Steve Bunyard, are you there? You Please come on up, Steve. So, how the 10 years worked out for you? You want to just go to the Great. podium right there? Very and, well, thank you. <laughs> and how long have you been running the show there? Um, I have been the president there for about three years. I was the chief operating officer for a few years prior to that. So, I've been here about six of the 10 years. That's fantastic. Yeah. It is a, a crown jewel of our community. We're really we, uh, love being here. thrilled that you are here. And we do have a proclamation, which I'll read for you. Whereas Ohio Health Dublin Methodist Hospital opened its doors to the community on January the 8th of 2008, and whereas over the past 10 years, Dublin Methodist Hospital has provided excellent health care to the Dublin community and beyond, and whereas Dublin Methodist Hospital integrates advanced technology and wellness-focused design to care for its patients, resulting in exceptional patient experience scores, and whereas its state-of-the-art facility incorporates live trees, multi-story waterfalls, and natural lighting throughout the hospital to foster health and wellness. And whereas since its opening, the hospital has expanded its services, including the launch of its robotic surgery program and full-time cardiology unit, where patients can receive cardiac imaging and utilize the diagnostic, diagnostic catheter lab. And whereas Dublin Methodist Hospital has seen an increase in the number of babies born there from 800 in 2008 to more than 2,000 births last year. That's remarkable. And whereas Dublin Methodist Hospital has been honored as one of the hospitals and Healthy Network's most wired hospitals for meeting rigorous IT criteria every year for the last nine years, in addition to its numerous quality and patient safety awards. Now, therefore, I, Gregory S. Peterson, Mayor of the City of Dublin, on behalf of the entire Dublin City Council, do hereby congratulate Ohio Health and commend Dublin Methodist Hospital for outstanding service and care to our community on this, its 10th anniversary. So congratulations. I saw you had the. Um, I saw you received uh, one of the highest ratings of hospitals, in, certainly in Central Ohio, if not the state, and you were the top of the heap, along with uh, I, I don't remember which other hospital, but I know that you got one of the highest available. Sure. So we're we're very proud of our of our quality. In addition to the two-story waterfalls and all those lovely things, we're very proud of the quality that we do have there, and we have been recognized by a number of different national uh, quality, uh, including Leapfrog and. Um, some of the STARS ratings with CMS. We're very proud of the staff and the physicians there, so thank you. 
You know, and I know that Marcus is, where did Marcus go? I know he has uh, been involved with the opioid <laughs> forums and different things that we go to and yes. conversational. I know that you guys are really embedded in our community in a very real way. Right. We greatly appreciate right. we, that we, support. Uh, we are thrilled to be in this community and look forward to another, uh, I don't know how many more decades, but um, I'll be around a while. But as many as you need. We have many as we need. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Appreciate it. Chief O'Connell, where are you? It is uh, Washington Township Fire Department, the ISO rating upgrade. Could you tell us about that, Chief? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor. Is Eric with you? Eric, come on. You can't hide in the back row. Come on. Eric's only been there, what, two months, and you're pulling this off already? That's why I'm in the back. <laughs> this, is, this is Chief O'Connell's initiative, so I'm going to stand behind it. Mayor, uh, members of council, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you about the fire department. Can I give you a, a brief update of where we're at and what we've been through in the past year? Uh, in early 2017, we were up for our reaccreditation. Uh, through the Commission on Fire Accreditation, they came out and evaluated the department and uh, looked at every aspect from our equipment to our training levels to our strategic planning to our partnerships. Every avenue, as you know, with the accredited groups you have, agency, the, the different departments you have. And uh, we're thankful to say that in March we met with the board and they reaccredited us for the third time. So we're really, really proud of that. Well, we're always continuing focusing on continual improvement, which is, which is what accreditation is about. So we also reached out to ISO, the Insurance Services Office, and Mr. Keenan knows all about the, the, that group. And basically what they did was they do a little bit different focus group, on, focus evaluation of the fire department. They look at how we move water, how we fight structure fires. Do we have the right staffing? Do we have the right equipment? Do we have the right hydrants? Do we have the right training and the ability to do that? So we reached out to them to, to make us better. We wanted to upgrade that. We were a class two. We wanted to upgrade to a class one. So they came in and evaluated us in July, and we were hoping to get a good Christmas present for them and move up to an ISO one. And we did. We found out on December 27th that we did move to an ISO one. And basically, for the citizens and the community, what that means is that is a factor. And again, Mr. Keenan could probably identify this a little bit better, but that is a factor in when they figure out your insurance premiums for commercial and residential. So again, that gave back to the citizens and. And though we're extremely proud of the accomplishments, that the ISO 1 rating along with the accreditation makes us one of 57 departments in the country. So we're really, really wow. proud of that. And, and wow. with that being said, uh, the credit goes back to the partnerships and, and the, the great staff that we have. We have great staff and, and great people that look for ways to help the community go above and beyond. And, and uh, we're so proud of that group. The trustees, their guides, they've been great supporters. Eric, the short time he's been a huge impact on the organization already, and we're, we're, we're so happy for that. Um, but also, uh, one of the biggest factors for us is the community. The support we've had from the citizens, the township, and, and the city of Dublin has been incredible. I mean, that is why we're successful. We know that. So though I'm proud of the status of what we've earned, I, I realize that we can't do this alone. And, and probably the, one of the reasons I wanted to come before council tonight was to tell you that it is the partnership with the city that has made us successful. I mean, we, we've got great people. We've got some great infrastructure. But the relationship with the city is why we're successful. And often, you, and I said this before in front of council, but you don't realize that until you have a crisis. And the tanker incident we had, within 30 minutes, we had the police chief, we had the city manager offering every resource the city of Dublin has to help keep us safe and to help make sure the citizens are safe. And uh, again, you can't, you can't ask for more than that. We've reached out to several of the, the different department heads, if it's, if it's Donna, if it's, if it's Daryl, if it's, uh, again, Dana, again, with the, the city manager, if it's the police chief, always, they've always reached out to us, offered anything that we need to make us successful. So, though we're very proud of our accomplishments, we realize that the partnership with the city of Delva, the infrastructure that council has put in place, even right down to the hydrants and our ability to move water, has made us successful. So, I just wanted to give you a brief update on the department. Very proud of the department. But most of all, I really, really appreciate what the city has done for us and what the township trustees have done, their guidance, things like that to make us successful. And I can't forget the citizens because without their support, we wouldn't be here anyway. So I just want to give you an update. On it. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. That's fantastic. Thanks, Chief. Eric Richter, the township administrator, anything you want to add, Eric? I, I, just to piggyback on the chief's comments, um, you know, the, clearly the, the Washington Township trustees were thrilled to receive this news over the holidays. Um, but really all I can say is to, I've got to congratulate Chief O'Connell and the entire fire department for their efforts in this. But on top of that, a number of Dublin City staff. Uh, if you have read that rating report, a uh, hefty 50% of that, um, uh, that rating is attributed to the City of Dublin. And, and the services that, you, services that you provide through 
communications, water, water supply, and things like that. So again, to piggyback on the Chief's comments, we don't do this alone. Um, the partnership is outstanding, and, and I think we share in this, this recognition. It was really fascinating reading the report. I just thought this was a, hey, we're going to get there real quick and take care of you kind of thing. But it's not. The impact, and like Mike, you, you would know. I mean, the, it permeates down into insurance premiums that you never would even think about. But it can have a significant impact. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. When I started with the township in 1983, we had seven firefighters. What do you have today? 100 and, about, about 105. About 105 firefighters. We had a $300,000 a year budget. And we just split with Perry Township. At that time, they were a joint department. We split it apart, built the station on Shire Rings, and then ultimately three more stations after that. And, um, you know, you've done a fantastic job over the years. And we appreciate what you do for us. And I know your, your response time is inside that golden four minutes or five minutes yeah, absolutely. from an EMS perspective. Absolutely. absolutely. And I, 70%, some 70% of our runs are EMS. That's and that's a big deal for our citizens. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Thank you for coming in. Congratulations. Appreciate thank you. it. Dan Sullivan. Dan is going to give us an update on the 2018 Memorial Tournament preview. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Good to see Council you, members. Thanks for letting me take a few minutes just to give you an update. You know, I try to get here at least once a year, maybe twice, and after this year's Memorial, uh, for some reason, I didn't make it over. So I wanted to first recap 2017 very quickly. We had a great year, uh, uh, all capsulized in, uh, in one week, and felt really energized about the success that we had coming out of that tournament. Um, in spite of the weather in the last hour or two of the, of the, uh, of the tournament overall, um, great attendance, um, record commitment to uh, uh, charities in town where we donated $2.4 million dollars. 1.8 to Nationwide Children's Hospital. So felt very good about where we ended 2017 and we're very excited about 2018. Uh, we're focused on really committing to um, continuing this world-class event in every way possible that Jack and Barbara Nicholas started. Um, and you'll see that through the broadcast and uh, nationally and internationally. And you'll see it locally. You know, we're, we're trying to take a look at every aspect of our tournament and ensuring that we're staying up with the times and ensuring that we're staying up with what we think our attendees want to see on a golf course. It's changed in 43 years. Those that came to the tournament 43 years ago had a completely different idea of what golf was than uh, those who go to the golf tournament today. Uh, very much nowadays it's about creating an experience, uh, creating an opportunity not only to see the greatest play in the game, but to uh, be entertained at all times. And uh, you see that at any sport uh, venue nowadays. And, and we're trying to keep up with the times, meanwhile, holding to uh, the integrity of what Jack and Barbara created in, in 1976. And I think we're doing a pretty good job of that. Um, we will focus on uh, a couple areas this year that will ensure that uh, we're telling the Dublin story. Um, we will uh, partner with the folks at Bridge Park and make sure that we have a connection between the tournament and everything that's going on there. Uh, we're going to do that from a, from a local perspective, but also from the way we promote our tournament uh, nationally and internationally. It's an incredible asset that you uh, have partnered with uh, the developers on in, in creating uh, something that is brand new and, and spectacular. And we want to make sure we tell that story at all, uh, at all times. Uh, our concert this year will take a elevated status. We'll have some more information here the first part of February. can't share it right now, but I will uh, the first part of February where... It'll give us a chance to just bring more um, interest and focus on that event, uh, meanwhile driving more uh, dollars to Nationwide Children's Hospital. Overall, we're trying to improve in every way possible, and I think all of you have heard lately about one decision we made around the golf course with our gate cuts. And uh, that decision comes with um, a lot of thought behind it. Um, the primary thought is that, just to give you a couple quick numbers, uh, last year we had 54 points of entry on our golf course. And if you uh, compare us to the Masters, they have two. If you compare us to the Players' Championship, they have one. Um, and they do that because uh, they do it for security reasons. They do it for control of, of understanding who's on property and, and, um, and uh, ensuring that they have an understanding of who's coming into the, the golf course. With 54, it's simply too hard to control, too hard to understand who's coming in and out and what they're bringing in and out. 
And we have some data from last year that just made us pause and think, how can we do it better? So we are going to be taking our gate cuts down from 54 to about 15. And those 15 gate cuts will be um, available, will serve the public, as we always have, through the main areas coming through number six and our main gate off the, uh, off the driving range, but also kind of resident cuts that ensure that the residents of Muirfield have a convenient way to get into the golf course. And all those who rent homes throughout the, uh, throughout the week will have that same convenience. We'll make sure that they have a point of entry uh, throughout the golf course. It may not be as convenient as walking right out the back door, but it will be as convenient as walking down the path into one of our controlled cuts that makes sure that we understand who's coming in and if they're coming in with a credential and ensuring that they're not bringing anything that, that uh, we would be concerned about. Um, it's become uh, a popular thing to try to get into golf tournaments without having the proper credentials or getting in with things that you're not allowed to bring in. And we're trying to get a, a, a good sense of um, or better control of that entire environment. And, and frankly, our partners at the PGA Tour um, uh, promote the fact uh, that we're doing a, um, we're making this change and have made recommendations along the way. So what we're doing from a communication standpoint, we did send a letter out to all the residents that have a gate cut and those corporations. We're calling each one of those uh, companies and individuals personally. We're having a conversation with them. Uh, this morning we sat with Bob Fathman and, and uh, Walter Zier from the Muirfield Association to make sure that the association is up to speed in everything that we're doing. And, and uh, we take it seriously and we're going to make sure that we're communicating in an effective way and accommodating everyone's interest along the way. So we have a big year this year. We want to say thank you for all the support uh, that you've uh, given us over the years. We look forward to partnering with not only you council, but management and making sure that we put on um, the best event we possibly can, which is widely recognized as uh, at the top of the charts in the PGA Tour. And I can answer any questions. Fantastic. If you have any. Dan, any questions? You know, I'd just add that uh, Dan's far too humble. He's due in large part uh, the reason for why that tournament runs so smoothly year to year. And it's a huge job. When I represented the Dublin Council in Japan, I visited Casasega Meka, Casasega Meka Country Club, which is where the 2020 Olympic Games will be held. And I had some, one of the members came up to me and I was giving a, a pin flag signed by Nicholas and uh, Matsu, uh, Hidaka Matsuyama. Mm -hmm. And they thought that was really, I mean, it was very, very special. But one of the members came up and asked me, do you know Dan Sullivan? <laughs> and I'm like, how many, you know, 10,000 miles away and, and uh, they're asking about Dan. So he is uh, world, world known. And we appreciate what you do for us here in Dublin. I don't Dublin. know if that's good or bad, but I'll take it. <laughs> it's amazing how many, how many people you bring in during the week? Well, we don't release that number, but it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And you bring them into this one golf course, you get them in, and you get them back out after a whole day event, and it is really unbelievable. What well, it takes a lot of people to do that, so thank you. And a lot of people are in this room represented. And, and uh, look, our partnership that we have with Dublin is unique. Uh, we share it all the time when we get together as a tournament with other tournaments around the country, and I say it all the time. If, if the cooperation that we have um, with you as council and with management and just the city in, in, uh, in total um, allows us to put on an event that is renowned and, and second to none. And without it, I think that we'd be something much less than that. So we really appreciate all the support. It's fantastic. Looking forward to a successful okay. tournament this year. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Comprehensive Annual Fiscal Report, or the CFAR Award 2016, is Robin Howard and Jamie Nicholson. Come on up. Tell us what this is all about. Welcome. Good. Welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jamie Nicholson. I'm the Finance Director for the City of Pataskala. I currently serve on the Executive Board of the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada. And I'm also President-Elect of the Ohio GFOA. I'm honored to be here tonight on behalf of the GFOA to present the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting to the City of Dublin. The Certificate of Achievement program has been in existence since 1946. Its purpose is to encourage and assist governments, school districts, and other public entities to prepare financial reports of the highest quality for the benefits of citizens and other parties with a vital interest in a public organization's finances. For more than 70 years that the program has existed, it has uh, achieved widespread recognition as the premier indicator of excellence in governmental accounting and financial reporting. In order to earn the Certificate of Achievement, 
the organization had to substantially conform to the program's demanding criteria, which go well beyond the minimum requirements of generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. Program participants submit copies of their comprehensive annual financial report, or CAFR for short, to the certificate program for an in-depth review and evaluation by two members uh, selected from an impartial panel of government finance officers, independent CPAs, educators, and others with specialized expertise and experience in governmental accounting and financial reporting. Reports are also reviewed and evaluated by members of the GFOA's professional staff. Only those reports that are judged by all reviewers who have substantially met the program's criteria are awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. This is not the first time that the City of Dublin has received this honor. Rather, tonight's presentation marks the fourth consecutive year that the City has received the Certificate of Achievement. The receipt of this reward award <laughs> reflects the professionalism and commitment of numerous individuals as well as many hours of dedication and hard work. It is indicative of the high degree of dedication and leadership on the part of the city's finance director, Angel Muma, and the city's other elected officials and accounting staff. The Government Finance Officers Association hopes that the, this award to the city of Dublin will serve as an example of accomplishment and encourage others to strive for the same high standards in their own financial reports. It is therefore my privilege on behalf of the Government Finance Officers Association to present to the City of Dublin with the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Thank you. And Robin Howard is accepting this on behalf of the department and Angel and all the people you work with. Fantastic. Really, what's uh, truly remarkable is not just that you got it, but the complexity of the financial operation you got going here, and it was in that environment that you still maintain that kind of standard, which is amazing. And it's not the, uh, this is not just a routine thing that everybody gets. This uh, it is a much lower percentage of organizations that actually put forth the effort to create this report as well as uh, meeting all the requirements. So thank you very much, Mr. Nicholson, for taking the time to come in and congratulate you. And, and Mayor, if I may, Angel uh, sure. could not be here tonight, but she wanted to thank, extend her appreciation. She wanted me to make sure I extend my appreciation to Council as well for all your support of our uh, financial team. So thank Great. you. Thank you very much for coming in. Mr. During, you are up. Scott Dring with the uh, Dublin Convention and Visitors Bureau with an update. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, if I may, I'd like to also introduce your City Council representatives on our board, uh, Phil Smith and Frank Wilson, who are back there as well. Um, it was a record-breaking year in 2017 for not only Dublin Tourism Ministry, but the, the CVB. We had a record of 2.9 million visitors come to the, uh, the City of Dublin last year. Um, our regional campaign um, in, in, the, in the city of Dublin, that's our effort to raise awareness and market and sell Dublin in Pittsburgh, Detroit, Indianapolis, Lexington. Um, Charleston Huntington had more than 7.4 million impressions, which was a record this year. And of course, the bed tax, which we're always uh, very aware of, that hit record numbers, uh, 3.2 million as a whole, um, for the first time cracking the 3.2 million mark as well. You know, I, I know the bed tax is always something, a metric that we always are interested in, in looking at. But I think it's so much more the impact our visitors have on the community than just the, the bed tax revenue. To give you an example, we have 2,300 rooms here in the city of Dublin. Uh, and we run about 70% occupancy in the city. So about, that's about 1,600 rooms every day is occupied here in the city of Dublin. Um, through our research, we know we have about two and a half people per room. So let's just knock that down to two. That's 3,200 people that are here every single day, every single night, looking for places to eat, looking for places to shop. Um, which is economic impact, it's jobs, it's income tax, so it's, it's a cruel component of our econ economy here in the city of Dublin as well. Um, in addition to that, the, the records that we, we uh, achieved last year, we're also going to see a dramatic increase in hotel development, not only in, in Dublin but nationwide um, on historical levels. Here in, in Dublin, we've had a 21% increase in our hotel supply the last two years. Uh, the city of Columbus has built 41 new hotels, almost 5,000 rooms in the last two years. Um, and over in Marysville, they have three or four hotels um, on the books as well. So I bring that up for two reasons. One, obviously competition. We're going to have to keep working hard. 
um, keep our pedal to the floor to make sure we, we build on that $2.9 million, uh, or two more, my, 2.9 million visitors and that economic impact. And the other aspect of this is the type of hotels that we're looking to get here in Dublin, in any community. Um, you know, I think you've heard me say before that just because you build a hotel does not automatically equate to more bed tax, more economic impact. It, it matters what kind of hotels you're building in the area that the kind of fulfills the kind of a visitor you're attracting. So the Bureau's kind of taken the lead and started dialogue with the city of Dublin, Dana, and others, um, our hotels, our board, to try to come up with a study that we're in the process right now that maybe will serve as a resource to staff, developers, P&Z, whoever it might be, um, to kind of give you background information on the type of the hotels that most benefit the city of Dublin. Um, now, we're not advocating hotels to bring in, not, not bring in, that's not our role. We just want to be a resource to all of you and give you the data that you need to, to kind of make those decisions. So um, that'll be done here in the, in the coming months or so. Um, I wanted to update you a little bit on the strategic um, alliance, the Downtown Dublin Strategic Alliance that we started about 18 months ago. Um, if you recall, that was an effort that we started that, you know, we felt when Bridge Park came online that it was really instead of Bridge Park and Historic Dublin kind of, kind of competing against each other, we felt it was a, a chance to really create one world-class de destination, really create a collaboration and a partnership as a whole. So we created this Downtown Dublin Strategic Alliance, which includes us, the CVB, the City of Dublin, uh, Crawford Hoying, the Historical Dublin Business Association, and the Dublin Historical Society. And we've done a lot of things over the last year. Uh, the, more, the one that you can really see in touch is the campaign that you see on here is um, that we started in November um, that's really kind of merges the two. Opposites attract was kind of the, the tagline here that we're using. Um, this was a total collaboration between all four entities. We each put in um, equal amount of money to do this, um, to buy ads. And it's more than just ads. It was a, a Facebook, Instagram campaign we brought in. Um, uh, face um, bloggers and influencers to bring it in. So it was kind of a multifaceted campaign that we'll continue to, to do in the future as well. Um, this can't, this effort's going to continuing. Um, you know, we have a meeting on a monthly basis. We're talking about transportation now, figuring out how to get people downtown Dublin from, from lunch hours here in Dublin, figuring out wayfinding and all kinds of other things. So we'll continue to keep you posted um, on that as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was our newest trail. Um, I know we've talked about the Ferry Door Trail that we started uh, two years ago. And again, these trails might seem a little gimmicky, but again, it goes back to economic impact. It's getting people in our community. It's getting people to, to buy stuff, getting people to raise awareness that may have never been in our community before. The uh, um, Ferry Door Trail has generated almost 2,400 people from 40 states and five countries in just two years. So our newest iteration that we're launching next week is called the Celtic Cocktail Trail. And it's a trail that we want to celebrate the tremendous dining product that we have here in town. We have 11 participating restaurants that have created their own um, Celtic cocktail um, uh, that, that ranges from a variety of things. Um, we're hoping people will go ahead and enjoy, hopefully not in one day, but throughout the whole year, <laughs> they kind of take their time and be responsible. And, uh, but once they get all that, we'll have um, T-shirts and all kinds of prices as well. And again, this gets people to these establishments, gets them spending money, gets people in our community as well. Um, and last, I kind of wanted to end on a very, very quick video. It's one minute, just kind of encompasses the, the last year that we had here in the Dublin Tours Ministry.
Thank you. Very nice. Scott. Yep. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from council? I think there are no your, expense uh, in your talent for your video. Exactly. Uh, high price. Uh, <laughs> search no. high and low. Exactly. Thank you. Only attractive people. <laughs> I think Good. on your Celtic cocktail idea, we're going to have to run our Uber deal <laughs> and tie that in with it. We do absolutely. That's <laughs> not bad, but we do have. We have talked with Uber and others that uh, we're obviously encouraging that. So you know, okay. Yeah. <laughs> It's fantastic. Thank you. Good idea. Thank you. Thank you. you do a yeah. fantastic job, Scott. Thank you. Absolutely unparalleled. Thank you very much. Uh, citizens and comments. Mike Tibbetts. Mike. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, Council. My name is Mike Tibbetts. I live at 116 Longview Drive, and I own and operate Brazenhead and Oscars. Been here for about 22 years. Uh, it's interesting to watch these videos because when we first came here, historic district had nothing. A couple burned out gas stations, <laughs> well, not burned out, closed gas stations, empty carpet store, et cetera. But uh, now it's got a lot of strong independence and a lot more on the way. And that's the kind of stuff that makes it work. But uh, I'm here to make you aware of something that's going on with the parking situation there. About, uh, oh, a little more than a year ago, late 2016, I sat down with uh, Mandy Bishop and uh, some other people from the city and said, we are going to close the street in front of your restaurant in one direction to accommodate the building of a new place that's coming up just your north. It's going to stay that way for about a year. Not news that any businessman wants to hear. Additionally, all your parking is going to go away that's on the street, parking that for... 20 years people have been used to using, probably many of you as well. I apologize, I'm coming over the end of a flu here. So, uh, all right, it's going to happen. You put your head down, you work hard, uh, you come out the other end, and sure enough, they said that it'll open again in November 17. It did. And uh, December of uh, 17 was a great month, on par with 2016, uh, before all this began. Wonderful. We came out the other end. We're happy to see the development. I've always felt when the water level rises, everybody goes up with it. Well, we had another meeting last month, and apparently we're building a library. And we're going to take all that away again. Uh, additionally, the parking on the east side of the street, and I'm on North High Street now, well, that's going to stay closed while we finish putting up another building. That's the Z2 building. Now. I've been in New York many times. They put up skyscrapers, and they don't close the sidewalks, and they don't close the streets. So do I know what can be done? No. I'm sure you guys probably weren't in the planning process of these details, but you know this hurts the guys that were there at the beginning of it. And while it's great to see all the new stuff come along, I think that uh, City Double needs to take a little step back and go, oh, what about the guys that got you there? So, uh, any questions on anything? No, thanks, Mike. I appreciate you coming in. Mike had called me, and I went, and we sat down and talked about this, I guess it was last week. Yes, it um, was. And I walked out and looked at what he was talking about, and the fencing is up where the library is going to be built, and it's now back away from the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is it was explained they're going to bring that out to the street, which makes it really difficult to park a car, and how do you get out that side sure. of the car? Your only option is to get out into the street. So I don't know whether there's something that can be done about that. And then on the other side, on the Z2 building, if you look at it, there's just those orange barricades that are still there that take up quite a, quite a distance of parking spots over there. So, and Dana and I talked about it. And I don't know, Dana, if there's anything you want to add. I mean, we're going to. Well, I don't have a lot to report tonight. I yeah. apologize for that. But I have asked, oh, it's all right. I have asked the staff to, uh, to take a look at, at what that means and what are some of the ways we can try to mitigate as we've tried to before, <clears throat> um, anytime there's construction around you, it's not always good news. I got that, hear you loud and clear. Uh, the good news is we'll still have the north-south traffic as opposed to just one way. I understand there'll be some impact on those parking spaces there, particularly across the street. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are opening up more parking as part of the, um, the Bridge Park West project. Uh, we're happy to and will, and I've asked the staff to take a look at this and also take a look at how we might try to mitigate some of that even relative to um, uh, valet parking and the like, because we don't want to disrupt that operation either. So I don't have a good answer for you tonight. I appreciate the heads up that we got. 
and uh, we're working on that, and we'll certainly be out to talk to you again about how do we how do we try to work with you to mitigate the impact as much as possible. We want you to stay a, a viable business in Dublin. Love going there, so we want to keep keep people coming to you. So. Well, thank you very much. I mean, the city has been very helpful. Uh, I just don't know that they had uh, the people I spoke to had much input on uh, what was going on with it. So Dana, we wanted to make people aware. And Dana, the um, the Bridge Park the West building has parking in, <coughs> inside. My recollection when we did that is there would be some dedicated part of that would be dedicated to public parking. There is some public parking. There there is a charge. I think it's like going to be like two dollars an hour or something like that. So there's. There's work to do there to educate people that that parking is available or will soon be available and make sure that patrons coming to that end of town know that. So that's that's something I didn't know if you were aware of, but we need to make sure that we're promoting that. Um, as part of the whole bid process and getting, now that we have construction sequencing better understood with a library and a parking garage, we uh, are putting together, I think we finalized our plan now that we have the bids put together and know what that's going to look like. Um, as a result of the uh, the responses to those bids so that we can better communicate to the immediate um, neighboring um, property owners uh, exactly what sequencing and construction is, how that's going to impact you, and so forth. So that, that information will be coming out very soon after the bids let, hopefully tonight. I appreciate your time, and I thank you for all your help. Dana, any updates on um, the roadway behind that those Z buildings um, as the extension of... <laughs> Indian Run wraps around behind the Z buildings. Where, where are we in construction with that roadway? I'll have to refer to Megan or Terry on that one. It's open? Okay. You know, and I'm, I'm wondering if we can't try to divert some of that activity that might want to happen from the front of that building that's requiring some of these parking space occupations or um, closing of them. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we couldn't encourage more you know, if we had to close that road behind there for a, a piece, uh, probably, you know, maybe we could supply some room back there for material storage <coughs> and all of those kinds of things. It might lessen up what we have to do on the yeah, high street I, side. As, as I mentioned, I agree. I think, I think we've got just some educating to do, and we've kind of been in transition as that project wrapped up in, what, late November, early December in reality and transitioned to the opening of the other building and the roads behind it. And trying to make sure people know that they can access those. I think people are so used to those being closed, they don't even know that they can drive them. So we need to make sure we're promoting that access. So. Well, and you, more than any other pinpoint on the map, took the hit with the road being closed. I mean, as far as a Dublin business, that is ground zero for the place you didn't sure. want to be during that period of time. And you are exactly the kind of restaurant we're trying to encourage through all of this stuff anyway. And so when you say dance with the one that brought you, I get it. I understand what you're saying, and, and we will... Um, We'll stay on it. We'll do as best we can to solve that problem. Thank you very much. Sure, absolutely. Thanks for coming in, Mike. And your food is great. Thank oh, you. I appreciate that. We'll go watch Ohio State stay undefeated. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for coming in, Mike. Uh, are, are there any other people that would, uh, folks that would like to testify on an item that is not on the agenda that just did not realize they needed to sign up? Seeing no hands, let's move forward on the consent agenda is there anyone on council that would like to remove the three items that appear on the consent agenda at this time hearing none I will make a motion that we approve those three items on the consent agenda is there a second a second, second. And? Mr. Keenan yes Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms yes Mr. Reiner yes Mr. Rosa yes Ms. Aluto yes Mayor Peterson yes Ms. Fox yes uh, second reading public hearing ordinance, ordinance da, uh, 01-18. Authorizing the city manager to execute a real estate and transfer property agreement and other necessary documents with Delta Energy Holdings, LLC, for the purchase of property located at 5555 Perimeter Drive. Donna? Good evening, members of council. Before you this evening is a second reading of an ordinance seeking authorization to proceed with the acquisition of property located at 5555 perimeter drive for a purchase price of $4 million. As per the memo in your packet, Finance Director Muma has provided a summary of prior discussions related to financial considerations for the proposed construction of a new city hall that have transpired over the past 15 years. And while further study is required to fully understand the city's programmatic and future facility needs, acquisition of this property provides a unique opportunity to fulfill the city's community plan objectives of creating a municipal complex that serves as a gateway to Kaufman Park as well as a community center for administrative and safety services. With that, I thank you for your consideration of this proposed acquisition and happy to address any questions you may have. 
Questions of counsel? I just have uh, one question about the, the second building um, uh, that was mentioned on one of the pages. Is that, a, when you say a second building, is that one that would be attached to the Justice Center or to this, um, the 555 perimeter? The, the, what you see there in your packet is purely conceptual. So none, okay. no, no site planning has been done. We haven't mm -hmm. done any uh, renderings or, or specific plans for the construction of those two other buildings. So we're not entirely sure what that second building would look like at this time. Okay, thank you. Have you engaged with any architects or anybody? I know that you don't have site plan drawings and things like that. Have we engaged with anyone on that? No, the only one that we've spoken with, uh, Vince Pepsidero, our planning director, and I spoke with M&A architects who were the original architects for the building that's currently there. They did come in and share some plans that they had put in place when the property was first built, uh, but we have not engaged any other architects. My understanding is that the facilities team will be putting out an RFP for a master planning uh, exercise that will result in not only the site planning, but then the development of those buildings. I know there's a lot of interest from our local architects that want to have the opportunity to participate in that. So when we do, if we can make sure that we look real and hard, real long and hard at who we have available here in town and make sure that they're included on those RFP opportunities, that would be great. Absolutely. Any other questions from council? Ann? Um, Vice, Am Vice Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. First reading ordinance is 02-18, Ann. Amending the annual appropriations for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2018. Dana. Good evening. I'll take this for Angel this evening. Uh, this um, ordinance amends the 2018 appropriations. The majority of this appropriation ordinance is to appropriate funds for three major projects. $4 million being appropriated for the purchase of the property of 5555 Perimeter Drive, which you just considered. $18.1 million is being uh, requested to upfront the construction costs related to the historic district parking garage and roadway network being done in conjunction with the construction of the Dublin branch at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. And you'll see these amounts listed a few times in the ordinance. Um, this is simply because we're moving money from the general fund to other funds in order to execute these projects. In the case of the parking garage and roadway improvements, these funds uh, from the general fund uh, will be repaid when long-term bonds are issued at a later date this year. Uh, this plan of uh, finance is consistent with what was presented and approved by Council in your, as part of your 2018-22 um, to 22 capital improvement program. Additionally, the inclusion of these expenses in the future bond issue is within the confines of our debt policy. In addition to the expenditures uh, that we just talked about, uh, where we're appropriating funds for reforestation, these funds are received when park and loo fees uh, are paid and according to code are to be used to plan, plant trees throughout the community and this amount represents the unspent funds at year end 2017. Funding in the amount of $605,200 is being requested for change orders related to North High Street widening project. This also includes utility relocations and $5,000 um, is being requested for the Ohio EPA permitting on the Tuttle Crossing Extension project. Uh, finally, pursuant to our general fund balance policy adopted by City Council in 2016, we're requesting $1,938,050 be appropriated from the general fund for transfer to the capital improvement tax fund. And this amount represents 25% of the uh, fund balance in excess of the 75% that Council designated to set aside. So staff's uh, requesting approval at the second reading public hearing on February the 12th. Any questions from council at this point? <clears throat> Dana, is any of these uh, monies going to be used for um, the restoration of buffers that we talked about in previous um, community development meetings and maybe the reorganization of the plannings going up? The Specif specifically along Avery Road? Avery yeah, Road Emerald yeah. Park, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that's what this part of this is intended for, but let me check and advise on that. We'll have an answer for you at the next meeting. Okay, thank just you. Just to be sure. And just, that next meeting will be just housekeeping, we just needed an introduction of that. Oh, I'll introduce that. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I have a quick question. Go. Um, in the report, you mentioned uh, the next bond issue, a date to be determined. Could you and or Angel give me an idea what you're thinking about? Uh, are we looking at months or years or decades so that we, we have a better idea 
you know, the feds are increasing the rates. We know that uh, financing, bond financing is only going to get more expensive. So what are your thoughts? And I don't need an answer now, but you can get back to us. Sure. I'd be happy to do that. I have a couple of quick questions. Um, one, the uh, $18 million transfer, that's the same $18 million that's transferred twice. Correct. Uh, as is the uh, six, 605000 um, also for the North High Street widening. Is that, is that an additional project, or is that cleaning up the last of the payment for the widening that has already occurred? That is, that is part of the existing project that already occurred. Okay. And, um, and if I answer any of that wrong, Angel will correct me by the next meeting. I promise you that. So. <laughs> she might call. She's I'll, I'll watch from my right phone. Now. Now. <laughs> and the um, $1.938 million transfer to the capital improvements, um, can we get an idea of where that $1.938 million is earmarked for? Yeah, I know we changed the policy from a portion of that to parkland and, and so on and so forth. So I'd just kind of like to know where that's going and keep a running barometer to make sure that we're investing in the, that we're not vacating our investment in the parklands by our new policy. Right. That's, we'll show how that translates over into the CIP and what that's intended to be spent on. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. We'll see you back on February 12th on that. Ordinance 03-18. Authorizing the city manager to enter into an infrastructure agreement with Gage Crossing to LLC for the Gage Crossing development. I'll introduce that. Thank you. Paul. Good evening, members of council. <laughs> this ordinance introduced this evening will authorize the city manager to enter into an agreement or an infrastructure agreement with Great Gage Crossing to LLC for the Gage, Cro Gage Crossing development a proposed residential housing project on a site located in Columbus, just east of Avey Road and to the south of the future Tuttle Crossing Boulevard extension. During the rezoning process through the city of Columbus, a traffic impact study was developed to identify traffic impacts and uh, traffic mitigation strategies. The study um, and its recommendations have been reviewed and accepted by Dublin and the other municipal and county jurisdictions involved with the project. The study found that there should be contributions by the developer to the city of Dublin. And you'll notice on the screen, you'll see the um, actual site itself. Again, Avery Road to the left and Tuttle Crossing Boulevard going horizontally across the diagram. Uh, the access points into Gage Crossing are going to be a full access point to the east, located between Avery, and Avery Road and Wilcox Road, and then right in, right out access, um, just immediately east of Avery Road, and then south of Tuttle Crossing Boulevard extension on Avery, so those are shown in the blue. Most importantly, out of the agreement are contributions to the City of Dublin, first in the amount of just over $31,000 for the left-hand turn lane on Tuttle Crossing Boulevard to the site, that's at the full access point, um, and then also the developer agrees to contribute just or nearly $12,000 in lieu of constructing the sidewalk along the um, east side of Avery Road along their frontage. And then equally important is the donation of right-of-way and easements uh, that are necessary for the Tuttle Crossing extension itself. Um, if the in infrastructure agreement is approved, staff will bring the easements um, before City Council uh, for your consideration and approval. Staff recommends approval of this ordinance at the second reading and public hearing on February 12th, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Paul. Questions from Council? I have one question. I see the 11897 is a contribution in lieu of a sidewalk along the Avery Road site frontage. I'm Correct. assuming we are trying to do some master plan, maybe. Um, that sidewalk will actually actually be built with the roundabout itself. Okay. So we'd rather they not build it. Right. Us remove it. But there will be sidewalk access Correct. that is constructed. Mm -hmm. Just needed to verify that. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Um, so, John? Oh, I'm sorry. So, um, all the right and left hand turn lanes, and, and from because the scale is so small on this, it's right. going to be installed so traffic won't be impeded. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And they'll actually be built with the Total Crossing Boulevard extension project itself. Okay. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike? Uh, Paul, can you remind me what the timing is on the roundabout at Avery and this extension? Um, we were originally planning on 2019 for construction. I think that's now with 2020. 
it's been moved out. Correct. Yeah. And on that uh, south side of that Tuttle Crossing Boulevard, the adjacent to Gage Crossing, do we know what the, set, the setbacks? Can you remind me what those are? What do you should well, ask? I have that on the screen. Oh, um, very good. Yeah. So the actual width of the parcel that we own, which was at the Bosan well, property, 150 feet. And then the setback, if you're curious, on the, from the path to the property line is 30 feet, and then 45 feet um, is the distance from the curb to the property line. I don't know what the setbacks are for gauge crossing itself, um, as required by the city of Columbus. That's a good answer. I don't remember seeing that in the packet. Uh, it wasn't. Ah. I thought you might ask. Paul, I have a question. Um, yes. And it isn't necessarily about this very piece, but it's about the area in general going south of Tuttle down Avery, okay. where the National Church residence is, which I don't think is that far away. Yeah, I don't have I don't that. know. If, uh, you probably don't have one. But I can bring it up if you... If yeah, if you can, if it's mm -hmm. on there. Give me one moment. Sure. You know, we had a lot of discussion about how that was going to develop south of there. And, right, right. And, well, of course, we know there's a lot of Columbus area we can't down there. We it. But, yeah, Kim Yoder, the, the gal that, that is uh, National Church residence, a lot of the residents are bringing up a concern that they only have one egress on to, um, and there's no light or anything there onto Avery Road. As that traffic gets heavier and heavier. Um, they are adding 100 units to National Church residents, so they have 200 units trying to empty out onto Avery. And then to the south of them is a subdivision that's going to be built, so that will add even more. Plus, across the street from them to the east, there's going to be multifamily. So Avery Road, and I'm not real familiar with what's happening, maybe you can clue me in, but there's a lot of concern and and worry about how their how those seniors will be able to they say now it takes 15 minutes just to get out of their entrance onto Avery Road um, I think you're indicating at this vicinity uh, which is down near Avondale right, uh, I don't Avondale. have this is really the best exhibit I've had but the southern portion of Avery Road okay right so just to keep this on our radar as we go forward because they're they're struggling now and there's okay. no doubt they'll be struggling in the future all right. Good to know. Thank, Thank you. you. What's the road from Wilcox that goes all the way through there that Hilliard, I think, just put in, or Hilliard and Columbus? Um, that would be Riggins. Riggins. Exactly. Have you been down that? I mean, it is a massive long road with a lot of land and a lot of multifamily already built. Looks like there's more going up. Does Riggins go beside National Church residence on through? Uh, it'll actually be the uh, Hayden uh, Run Boulevard. As it extends, as it extends. Up over the river. is there ingress, egress capable there maybe later? Uh, no, there isn't because of the embankment. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Paul. See you back on February. See you February twelfth. Resolution 04-18 and authorizing the city manager to enter into a guaranteed maximum price contract with Turner Construction Company Inc. for construction of the downtown Dublin parking garage, roadway improvements, and landscaping enhancements. I'll introduce that. Thank you, Christine. Good evening. Uh, as council is aware, uh, in um, May of 2017, the city and Columbus Metropolitan Library System uh, entered into a development agreement uh, for the joint development of the current property, which would include contributions from the city of a parking structure and a street system. Uh, we have gone through lots of steps uh, to get to the point we are today where the designs are completed. Basically, the projects have been bid. And if you recall, one of the terms of the development agreement was that we would agree to use a single uh, construction manager on this project, largely in part because the compactness of the site, the desire to have um, as much coordination in construction as we can possibly get, and to save money by having a single kind of project management team on site coordinating and being responsible for all the implementation. The uh, library system had gone through a competitive process several years back. Uh, among co construction managers and selected Turner. And we uh, advanced our discussions with Turner. We're very satisfied with the construction management arrangement under terms uh, same as the library had negotiated for their role as construction manager for the city. What's before you this evening in um, resolution 
0418 is the actual resolution that would authorize the city manager to enter into a guaranteed maximum price contract with Turner Construction uh, for the construction of all those facilities. Those include the library structure, uh, the construction of the street system around, I'm sorry, the parking structure, the street system around the parking structure and library, as well as the grounds of remembrance enhancement just south of the grounds of remembrance that council approved as well. All those development plans have been before council for final approval uh, on those, and those are included within this project. Uh, the bids on the project have come in extremely consistent with the allocations in the CIP. In fact, uh, the closeness with which the schematic estimates held to the final construction numbers are just about spot on. So we feel very good about the pricing, very good about the bidding that uh, Turner advanced on this within the marketplace. Uh, they have um, 14 separate contractors doing our work and well over 30 contractors doing the library's work uh, on that. And uh, I think folks are pleased with the way the bidding has gone. Uh, with that in mind, um, I think council has been kept up to speed with regard to the basic advancement of the project and the contingencies. Once this contract would be authorized, the appropriations would be finalized, uh, the city would then close with the library. You may recall in the development agreement, there was a series of contingencies on the side of both parties. Effectively, those contingencies have now been satisfied. Uh, so at the conclusion of the uh, final appropriations of these dollars, we would be in a position to have a closing and proceed with, uh, with construction. Uh, we are recommending to you tonight that um, the city manager be authorized uh, to enter into a guaranteed maximum price contract with Turner Construction, for the construction of the downtown parking garage, the abutting roadway systems, and the landscape enhancements for the price of $17,697,550. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions from council? Yeah, Terry, um, as I think the uh, guaranteed price contract's a good direction. What are the types of things that aren't necessarily covered in that type of agreement. I didn't see that necessarily in the documentation. That what kind of things aren't covered? Right, would be excluded from that guarantee that we could potentially see happen. I'll see a cost. Uh, in effect, uh, there's a whole series of assumptions articulated. I may have Megan and others are, uh, jump in on this if I oversimplify it. But in effect, based on everything we know about the project, all the plans as they've been drawn, all the note con uh, conditions, we have structured it so that the subcontractors, for example, take on the risk associated with rock. If they hit more rock, that's on them. But if, as when we did the high street project, you dig in the ground and you find utilities that nobody knew were there, or, or conditions of, I'm picturing uh, buried uh, uh, septic tanks on the old library site or stuff that no one knew about, you can find anything else about, that are unknown conditions that aren't covered, those are the kind of things that could be impacted by this. But there's been a tremendous amount of design and due diligence and testing on this project. So we, in our building, luckily, it's a fairly straightforward building. The biggest area of volatility on these sometimes ends up being the private utilities and uh, getting them to do what they need to do and keeping their pricing firm on those elements. But based on everything that's been quoted today, the design, all the fees we understand, uh, we think this, this contract amount is good and we think the contingencies are appropriate for the project today. Yeah, any owner-directed changes that might come along along the way also would be elements of that also. What about weather? I'm sorry? Weather? Uh, how weather specifically dealt with? Non-compensable, non yeah. So they're taking the risk for weather? Yes. Yeah, and in fact, our job will be done quite likely before the library job is done. We have the simpler building mm -hmm. uh, on this with the road system. So I think in terms of just critical path items, uh, that's going to be driven by the library completing its work. So who, uh, we get a bond from, we, we, this job would be bonded in as much as it's a city job. That correct, even in spite of the fact that it's a, a GMP, correct? No wonder if they get bonds from their subs. Done. They, yeah. they would get bonds from all, fact, all, all the, the subs the as subs. well. Yeah. Right, we're on, we're on the hook for the construction? Uh, for the builder's risk portion, in other words, for any uh, property casualty loss is ours. Property loss would be ours. Um, is it a wrap, do you know, for the, in terms of the liability and the workers' comp and? No. It's not a wrap, so everybody's on their own. And then one other question, and I'm not that familiar, we're relatively new on these, on these guaranteed maximum price contracts. Um, it would probably begs the question that there's not a contingency built in because it's guaranteed. There's no 
in a normal contract, we would have a, a 10 or 15% contingency number built into the deal. We do not have, probably do not have that in this scenario, or do we? Yeah, there are a series of contingencies baked into these. In most cases, the owner has control over those in terms of approving aspects of that uh, with regard to it. I think Is it our money or their money? Ours. It's our money that they can use in the event that we hit that uh, underground uh, yep. storage tanker. Okay. We know we're, we're so new at this. Yeah. Like what, what we did one other one. Yeah, there's some contingency in the contract that is designated as the contractor's contingency, and then there's some that's designated as the owner's contingency to be used as deemed necessary by the owner. Can we see those if it, uh, bring them up in our next packet? I'd like to, I'd like to take a look at that. Of, yes. Wasn't that the 300,000? Terry actually has a slide that I think he's going to pull up that shows the breakdown. Well, he's pulling up that, that up, Megan. This is our, would this be our fourth GMP type Third. project? Third. Third. Yeah, so we had Justice Center, Pedestrian Bridge, and then this project. The other one Justice was the Center. Justice Center. That was the very first one that the city did. Mm -hmm. And that that was about a $11 million project, Justice Center? Yeah. So to be clear, the $300,000 contingency is on top of other contingencies well, Terry, that would be built in? The slide that Terry is going to bring up will show the breakdown within the contract, so I think it will become more apparent once you see that. I wonder, it'd be interesting if you could figure it out, but there's probably a little bit of risk built in where we might pay a little extra pop on a, on a guaranteed uh, because of the risk back and forth. But any any idea what that might be? Would it be what a that premium is? Is the premium 5% or 10% or some number? I'm just curious. I mean, I, I'm a believer in this. Um, obviously, yeah, it's a big project. There's a lot of money, and uh, certainly the pedestrian bridge would be a really good example of, of some things you could get into some hot potatoes on. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm, I'm Don McCarthy. I'm the owner's rep for your project. Um, if I could understand your question again, I might be able to answer it. What's the premium that you're paying for a GMP? Well, it would seem to me that if 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 we were be our, if we had a typical contract that they would go out, they'd go to bid. Uh, that it might be one number, and given the fact that we're passing risk on by way of a, a GMP, it would seem that they've got to be built some kind of premium into that to go at risk for what might happen. So there is um, in the form of in the in the contract format, there's a um, um, a construction contingency that Turner is or the CM is allowed right. to have. Uh, we competitively bid that. In this instance, we negotiated the same deal that the library had negotiated several years ago. I believe it's 2.5% is the um, construction contingency that is in the um, uh, GMP for Turner's risk. So the premium, if you were to go lump sum bid, you know, if you were to design the plans 100% and lump sum bid it, in theory, that wouldn't be put in the lump sum number that the general contractor would submit. But then again, um, anything that's gray in the plans becomes an argument point. In this instance, they have a 2.5% contingency in there, and, and our position would be that's your risk. Yeah, and that, I, I, like the, I like the concept, and I think yep. it works really well. And I know we were talking earlier, Ohio State has used it uh, quite a lot as well. So It's, um, it's more of a collaborative environment right. as opposed to an adversarial thing. Both delivery methods work, but this is far more collaborative. Um, one of the things that Terry mentioned as we were talking about getting to our final scope, there was a, a tremendous amount of uh, um, um, insight that we were all getting, giving and taking with respect to finalizing the final scope and the budget. The, the GMP ended up being pretty anticlimactic in terms of where we were trying to get to. So it was, it was very collaborative. And I would think the rock risk is a big deal. We, to it the extent was. we've mitigated that, that's, if was. you watched them build that building at the corner of Bridge and High, I think they were out there for months and months pounding, pounding rock to get that lower level done. So, so initially when the bids came in, uh, everybody took, took a big shot at the rock because our soils investigations you know, showed everybody the rock. Everybody came in with, with some pretty high numbers. During the scope review process of each of the subs that were affected by the rock, we narrowed that risk for them. They, took, they ended up taking on the risk. The savings in that process came back to us. When it was all said and done, I think we probably picked up about $400,000 
that fell to our side of the equation when we finally worked through the process with everybody. So again, very collaborative. Yep. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, did you do, do they do drillings, borings to, to determine rock? You, you've done all that. Yep. And I'm just curious, where is bedrock there? Uh, it depends on, on where you are. You know, mm -hmm. the closer to the, uh, to the river, it's more shallow. Um, we think that there's about, depending upon uh, which trade we're talking about, there's probably about 1,500 cubic yards of rock that have to come out. Um, and it's, it's rippable rock. We call it rippable. You can just kind of get a big backhoe and just rip it out as opposed to, you know, some of the other peel ways versus of getting blast. rock. Sorry? Is it more of a peel versus a blast? Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't come out in a straight line, you know, and that's some of the risk that we had to deal with. You know, you, in our business, we tend to draw things in straight lines and rock doesn't come out in a straight line. So we had to deal with, you know, how to, how do I allocate that risk for when we rip it out of the ground? There was some good contractor experience uh, on both the High Street project as well as all the stuff that happened on the east side uh, with regard to the nature of the rock, and I think that added to the comfort level as well. Yep. My understanding um, from talking to a few folks that um, when you have these um, GMPs that most of the time people have worked all along, as you said, and kind of understand the process, and that you get to a point in your construction documents that you're pretty far along the road. So yes. you must be over 50% finished on your construction documents, or? Uh, we're, we're almost, well, we're in for permit, so we're you're in for permit. You're pretty far along. 100%. Oh, okay. and this was a design build. This is stuff no. that uh, Turner, as the CM advisor, worked with us through those phases to help us understand right. costs. They would bounce it off different kinds of subs to understand mm -hmm. impacts. Right. But when Turner went out, they had essentially complete drawings yep. uh, on that. So these are very complete competitive drawings that are really quite tight. So that eliminates po the possibility of a lot of changes, contingencies, things like that when you're that far along in construction drawings. Exactly. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you was, um, um, because you said there are efficiencies in having uh, this work together, obviously your project managers on the, on the site that are working on both are aware of everything. It's, you're not bringing in new project managers or someone who doesn't know. These are people that have gone all the way along with the architects, designers, engineers. So that gives you that opportunity so you don't bring in someone new. We've had a lot of meetings on the coordination of, of the work and access and egress and safety and pedestrian traffic. Uh, we've had a lot of meetings on that. Yeah, in other words, Turner's not bringing in somebody new to work on nope. one phase. Nope. You've got we dealt someone. with one team, right. the whole project. Right. Yep. And I take it that when you said when it came in on the estimate, based what the GMP is now, you were the percentage was very narrow. I am, I'm assuming. No, it was, it was negligent. I mean, it was. I think Terry, it was twenty two thousand dollars, or okay, so that's far less than five percent, isn't it? On seventeen million, that's pretty, right. pretty. Thank you. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Uh, my only question is with respect to the design of rock crest. I know there was a tremendous amount of discussion about how we would treat rock crest, where it goes. Um, I, I was under the understanding that we might see some further design on um, how the termination of rock crest is treated for this phase of this project. Um, I haven't seen any drawings on that. Um, I'm not but, aware of any additional design. I think the, the last issues, as you looked at the Landscaping along that area dealt with things like the dry laid stone along the vault wall. Those all have been incorporated. All the landscaping comments have been incorporated as well. Uh, I got a couple of graphics here uh, that depict uh, the most current. Let me pull it up real quick just to give you a sense. So, this is kind of the perspective if you were uh, on the school property looking east on Rock Crest. That is the landscaped. Um, Grounds Remembers transition area on your left. Uh, you can see how Rock Press and um, Franklin Street, North Franklin Street meet at this point. So what part of the road, where will the road end uh, with respect to this contract? Okay, let me give you a graphic that shows you what's being built. So this shows you what gets built as part of this contract in the way of roadways and the parking garage and the other facilities. You can see uh, where the uh, Franklin Street and Rock Press, you can see kind of the new pedestrian connections that get folks uh, to the park 
and into the grounds of remembrance in the cemetery. Uh, all those now are fully accessible, ADA. You'll have uh, elevators in that corner of the garage. Both parking lots will have handicap accessibility to it uh, with regard to that. And uh, this actually shows you the, uh, uh, the after condition for the roadways, the buildings and the improvements superimposed over what's there today. When we had talked about this previously, I can see it here at the end of Rock Crest or on the western edge of Rock Crest, it kind of is veering to the right, although the parking garage is straight. Oh, goodness, you're going to make Actually, me use this Actually, the parking garage does have a little curve to it there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what, what I'm referring to is this area here, how we... Um, Is there something you need to hit so I can work on? I don't know. <laughs> no, that isn't operational yet. I don't that is oh, the that annotation. That's, that's so well, that would uh, could, could I have the laser, <coughs> please? So, so um, you're you're wanting to know what that stub street looks like there? Is that stubbed off or is it um, right? How, so how is it terminated? According to this, you know, it kind of comes up to this area, and then you kind of see it go off to the right at this point in time. And there was a lot of concern among our residents, and I, I thought among council too that we didn't that we were of the opinion to keep Rock Crest away from um, the park and the Indian Run North Fork um, or South, South Fork. No, that's North. Uh, that we were trying to keep this Rock Crest away from there, and I see a bend on the end of this roadway that's leaning us that direction, and. Yes. I, this is the same alignment as went through all the platting, preliminary, final platting, final design. I think the discussion that got into those issues at that point was triggered in part by as it moved forward and might cross Shawan Falls. What's the impact? Our strong recommendation from the staff was that this green that we are creating be a continuous green between the roadway and Indian Run uh, as it continued uh, on there, that there not be any development between this roadway and the Indian Run. That all be public park and green, generally reflective of the scenic easement that we've secured from the law and that's really the area we're trying to protect that and as much else as we possibly can this just terminates the road at that location <laughs> but continues along that alignment that i think has been a part of all the the plats everything else we brought forward the garage as you can see does get very close in those areas that's actually where the bike entrance and a whole series i'm talking about past the garage the garage ends right here and i'm, I'm talking about this section that starts to you know, there's nothing head to with, the north i think with regard to that the pre you looking at different ways for that <coughs> future but I think this is fully consistent with everything that's been shared with council thus far but it's not designed to have a road go through there uh, in a year or five years no, or even no. ten years I don't think the school's got anything imminent and we certainly don't as well but uh, the good news is with that roadway uh, that piece of rock press is among the first things that gets built and our hope is that by June of this year it's open and that will actually provide access to the parking lot of Indian Run uh, on that while North Street gets built over the summer uh, with regard to it. Plus, it'll be a signalized access point starting next spring, early summer, which will allow cars to come in and get out in a much safer way than they can today. You know, I think you guys have presented a whole series of uh, drawings on this that we've all reviewed over and over. And I also think the uh, the area that we were just discussing, I think the connectors are really well done that get us into the grounds of remembrance and over into uh, Sean Falls hiking area. So I think it was, that was all worked out very well by the landscape architecture team. So I don't see any real problem with that. I do think that. this image is misleading. Uh, this one shows pavement continuing beyond the walkway. And I don't think it does. I think that walkway is the terminus. So mm -hmm. the walkway that you see on the west side of uh, Franklin Street going across to the grounds of remembrance is where the project ends. That pavement doesn't continue as it shows on there. My question was primarily around the treatment of the terminus of that roadway. Of, I, I want to make sure that we treat that appropriately and it doesn't look like it's a road to nowhere or it's a road that's supposed to go somewhere that, that doesn't at present. That it actually looks like it's terminating. In other words, don't put a stub out on mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right, that's where I was headed earlier. I, I, I want to make, let us come back to you on that because I, you know, whether it's a I don't think we've if seen anything on that piece. Yeah, I mean, if you want a piece of curb slipped on the end of that, or you want a bunch of planners, or you want signage, or you know, we can do all that. I, I want to be careful though to make sure that we're not implying that because that road terminates there, 
at that crosswalk, which was something that your veterans committee wanted to have, it's not implying that that road's going to go on because we've had that West Bridge Street discussion and we've said not doing that unless, you know, down, no pun intended, down the road, there's a revisit to that and, and someone wants to redevelop that site, which is the school site, which I am not saying will ever happen. Um, that's probably a discussion for another day, but what we have said is we're, we're stopping our planning on that right now. We are not looking at extending that road, although there have been discussions about potential alignments of that road going further west. We just kind of said, look, until such a time that opportunity presents itself, that should be a dialogue for another day and, and, and will be. And I, I just want to make sure we're not, everyone understands, we're not implying a continuation of that road, but that road's got to end somewhere. And it's got to end in a way that you can turn onto Franklin Street and there's a safe crossing there uh, to accommodate the veterans. Yeah, the and it's not members. just so the road terminating, but also yeah. not curving and going. You well, well, know, right, and that's, it's got to stop that. somehow, yeah. some way. And, yeah. and so I, I, just I want to feel just make like sure it's finished. I, 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 I want it, w yeah. wherever, wherever the end of that is, I want it to feel like it's finished. Yeah, maybe we, not, you know. Not we can, a pause or a something, right. but it's finished. I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. Can you do an iteration? come back to that. Just do an iteration street scene reflecting what her comments were. I'll show you what's in the plans in terms of what's finished. We'll come back to you on that if that's okay. But I understand exactly where you're heading. That's great, thank you. Sure. A couple more questions on the financing part of this. Yes. Um, so on the the way I read the um, amount of money that dedicated to the parking garage, this is net of the contribution of the library. Correct. So in the case of a contingency and an overrun for whatever we refined it, is that a shared liability or is that fall to the city exclusively? In other words, is that net contribution done? That contribution happens at closing. So at closing, they deliver a check to us for $1,083 mm -hmm. uh, on that front. That's their contribution to the parking garage and agreed upon cost as if it had all been built as a surface lot in Dublin uh, on there. Yeah, they, don't, they wouldn't have any further liability because the, the agreement was that it would, it would basically be what it would have cost to put the surface lot back together, end of story. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But because the surface lot would have had maintenance obligations, they do make an annual payment of over fifty thousand dollars towards maintenance and operations. Great. And then finally, we heard earlier about the importance to the businesses in this area um, and the timing. So I know inherent in this is timing and scheduling, et cetera, so forth. So as this gets finalized, we think about that. I don't know what, what, if there is indeed an economic consideration here, but figuring out how to do that. Um, we're happy to share with you if you have an interest come in some of the current thinking with regard to key phasing elements that gets into some of these issues of uh, how the area is impacted. If you'd want to spend a couple minutes on that, we could share that. I think that'd be very helpful because we get a lot of questions out and about of how, how this is all going to happen. And if we could articulate an answer, that would sure. be helpful. It's important to note that Don's still having discussions with contractors and twisting arms and convincing. So what these reflect is a combination of what we believe is feasible uh, things we are aspiring to do, and some of these we're still working on. So what you're seeing before you now is the condition that would exist from roughly February through early June. Uh, and during this scenario, folks are working as hard as they can to get Rockcrest built. Uh, on that, you'll see a piece of North Street. The lanes actually shift to the south on North Street. If you look closely, there's two lanes in each direction that a lot of work is focused on primarily Rockcrest, secondarily uh, Franklin Street. Uh, during this period of time, there's a construction entrance coming in at uh, where Rockcrest hits um, High Street. Some of these uh, depict the uh, pedestrian walkways that we are trying to achieve, what gets maintained, what doesn't, what can't. These are what we're having discussions about. None of this is final yet. These are the, the kinds of ideas that the as the engineers and the traffic maintenance people look at this information, we push back with contractors. That's the stuff in the remaining negotiations that we're still working on. The, the goal has always been to keep parking on the west side as long as we can. We just need to know that there's safe conditions when that, what the, when that can occur uh, on there. We need to understand with the amount of construction happening to build the library, all the new back, back of curb improvements, uh, the construction traffic coming and going from that site creates a safe condition for folks to do that. So we're working on that. But this is a condition that exists for about five months in the project. Very heavy emphasis. You can see 
Darby lot is still open, but you get into it from Darby Street at this point, which really will be the permanent condition with the Darby lot. And uh, there's still access to the Indian Run lot. And then you can see up at the northern end of the Indian Run lot, that's the construction offices of, of Turner uh, on the project here. So this is being looked at uh, as, as a first idea. There's also a discussion that for the crossing, and Megan, you may have to chime in if, on this one, at the crossing of um, High Street, just north of Rockcrest, that we have a pedestrian activated crossing at that point uh, to make for a safer situation there. And I think that's being contemplated as well. But these are the kind of things that are framing the discussions that are still ongoing uh, with regard to the project. On the next phase, which is the most disruptive to the historic district, I believe. This is when North Street gets totally reconstructed. And you can see this starts in June and runs through, I believe, August, generally of this coming summer. Rockcrest is done. You can see the new access point and a signal that directs people into the Indian Run lot directly. We are trying to make it function like it functions now so that folks from the Indian Run lot and the Darby lot can go back and forth. You'll see that little road, temporary road connection that we're gonna to try to negotiate with the school district uh, on that to see if we can't make that happen. Because if people enter the Darby lot and it's full, want them to be able to go to the Indian Run lot and obviously want people to be able to leave through Rock Press. This is probably that most disruptive period uh, during that construction and happens, I think, prepared about three months currently done is what's contemplated. Correct. And Terry, that's really been designed to create as little impact as possible on the school site, right? Yes. To try to squeeze but in the that. schools being out of session during that three month period by taking away North Street effectively during that period of time, we minimize that impact. And then finally, for the remainder of the construction, Rock Press is open, North Street is open. Uh, we have good access to the, to the parking along those situations there. And uh, most of the construction activity in terms of the streets is happening to finish up Franklin and the on-site improvements is happening through the remainder of the construction, which is probably through spring of 19. Correct. If I've lied, misconstrued, oh, nailed the wrong it. direction. You've got it committed to memory. That's kind of the current thinking right now as these exist. They will continue to get refined. We'll keep you up to speed on major things that kind of impact this as we're going forward. And Terry, the contractor has agreed to this approach. Terry, it seems as if, um, in looking at this, it, it's amazing how you can get the traffic around here. But, but I think there is a big concern. I'm seeing that uh, closed pe pedestrian route on the uh, west side of North High Street for the entire project. That's what this showed from the engineer. Right. We're, we're evaluating those. Yeah. I think when, you, when we think about it, if there's any way, because I, I think that we have asked more than we need to ask of these businesses on High Street to sacrifice for the good of others, that if we can't get, if we can somehow get that open, yeah. I could understand three months, but the entire length of the project, I would really part need of, to open it up. Part of the west side, keep in mind, is on the High Street project, we did nothing behind curb. So everything we knew would just get torn up and be messed up until the library project was done. So everything up to the curb, all the sidewalk. What's on there now is a temporary sidewalk that we want to keep intact as long as we can. But we also know the library building is the long lead item building on there. And you can see a lot of their stuff and their entrances and their roadways and their construction is going to come right up to that. So our goal is to try to make it as accessible as much of the time as we can. Don said it's the kind of fence that can be moved. And we'll have our people kind of work with the contractors to schedule as much as possible. We just can't commit yet as to how much of the time. I think the other good news that Dana mentioned, the Z1 parking garage, uh, when I talked to Crawford Hoeing last week, they were trying to finalize the gates and the equipment and kind of the payment mechanisms to get those work. They thought they were within a week or two of those functioning, and there will be a new supply of over 200 parking spaces there since obviously the number of the commercial spaces, one, even the first major commercial tenant slated to move in there this April, but there'll still be a lot of vacancy in there, so there should be an abundance of parking available in that facility, albeit cost for cost uh, during this time frame. There'll be signage that shows that that's parking uh, for the public because now it seems as if it's private and you would not even attempt to yeah, go I in. I think the, um, the signage with regard to the standard public signage consistent with our kind of wayfinding and signage plans I think is due to go up. And, and I think as the parking, the different lots come open and closed, I think thinking through some ways to let the public know What's going to be open when closing next month, opening next month, or something will 
keep down the frustration points because we'll get used to A and then B is going to. Our, our, we'll our goal is that both of those public lots stay open through the duration. Oh, okay. That's our goal. Well, I've noticed a lot of construction traffic. I think not to pick on the electricians, but there are <laughs> several electric. They're the same. There's about seven of them that line the street. Is there a place for them to park other than on the street? Do you know which project? Right along, the, right building along the, the, the way. Right along. I don't know what they're working on, but they park in the spots right along yeah, the I, I think we're I think we're getting some contractors parking on North High Street related to the Crawford Hoing Crawford one, Hoing. and so they're finishing up, you know, some of that along North High Street. That so could be, and that's something we'll have to police with yeah. with our, our neighbors across the street. Um, we're parking for you know for the library work right now. We're parking inside the fence, so there shouldn't be anybody from I'll call it our project that's parking outside that great thank you it's gonna it will we'll just have to be very diligent in policing yeah. all that all you can do is the best you can do right yeah yep any other questions from council no you know as a three-part plan I, I I gotta compliment you because I think this is about all you can really do and I think you've done a good job trying to keep the public parking open during the different phases so I think you put a lot of effort into this and the pedestrian traffic too yep. see where you've rerouted it during every phase and done a really good job so yeah, one thing you. that's missing on here is we don't think there's good pedestrian access from the Indian or from the Indian run lot to the south yeah. uh, we need to create a pathway uh, to, so that people can get to the Darby lot and the other restaurants in that area as well so those are the kind of things we're, we're exploring we still have to have some discussions with the school to kind of finalize these arrangements but want to make you aware of the general thinking okay thank you I, I want to take the opportunity too, if I may just to, to um, Thank well. I want to thank Don for his, his work on this, and, and Terry and Megan, and, and all the team. But I, I want to thank our schools. They have been terrific and patient partners in this. As we have gone back to them and said, "Hey, can we work with you on a temporary lot for some construction trailers?" And the fence is going to go this way, and then we're going to, and that's going to continue. And, and we're keeping constant dialogue with uh, Superintendent Holy and, and and the staff there to make sure that we're coordinating. But I, I can't thank them enough for their cooperation, the spirit of cooperation, as you all know, has been terrific. But when it gets into the eaches here on this stuff, it even gets more complicated. And, and I just want to make sure to publicly thank them for all their help. This couldn't happen without without their help. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Tom, for coming. Well, Any other questions for Tom? Okay. Ann? Uh, Mr. Rosa? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Okay, under the other portion of our agenda, preliminary and final plot building Z2 and the Dublin West Plaza. Logan, it's all yours. Yes, good evening, Mayor and uh, members of City Council. This is a preliminary and final plot for the Dublin West Plaza and Z2 building as part of the Bridge Park development. The site is located on the east side of North High Street, just north of the intersection with North Street. The plat includes the subdivision of land into two lots for public and private development. Uh, all of the projects that are located within this boundary have received approvals through the public review process and are currently under construction. Uh, shown on the screen is the preliminary plat with the specific portion outlined in the uh, dark, thick black line. The second portion is for the final plat, uh, which also includes all existing and proposed easements for access, maintenance, and utilities. Lot one that is shown on the screen is for the Dublin West Plaza, and lot two is the Z2 building. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of this to City Council uh, with the one condition that's shown on the screen, and staff is also recommending approval of the preliminary and final plats this evening. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Questions from council? I have a couple questions. Um, one, I just wanted to verify. There was no discussion about this at the planning and zoning. We have their meeting minutes dated December the 7th. Um, it does not indicate that there was any discussion. Was there no discussion about this? Correct. There was no discussion. It was placed on the consent agenda and approved at the beginning of the meeting. Okay. Uh, there was a lot of discussion from the ARB folks in, in previous meetings. Um, so my, my plat related question is about sort of the, um, the, 
jettison part of the plat that comes down to uh, to the south. I think if yeah, this if you could put that. Um, so I think south is to the right on that. Yes. Correct. Um, so uh, you're speaking of the portion that extends. Um, that's the tail portion of lot two that curves around. Is that the portion you're yes. discussing? Can you give me a little of the background of this irregularity in the shape? Um, to my knowledge, it, it has to deal with a lot of the land transfers that have happened in this area, as well as just clean up with um, the remaining pieces of land that are around here. Um, so with the design of the Dublin West Plaza, the reason that you kind of have that curve in between lots one and two is um, the curved portion that extends really right through the middle of this is the location of the uh, public stair that extends and connects down to provide a pedestrian connection to North Street. Um, and so for an order for all of that to stay on public property under public maintenance and things like that, uh, it was designed this way so that lot two would be still under ownership of Crawford Hoeing and then lot one would become all under uh, city, city maintenance and city ownership as part of the West Plaza. Okay, so for lot two here, there is no planned vehicular access whatsoever? Correct. It is, it is all pedestrian access and all of their parking has been accounted for with the parking garage in the Bridge Park West building, the Z parking garage. So I'm, I'm wondering about future maintenance of this area to the south. Um, I, I scaled it off and it seemed to be only around 15 feet wide. Um, what, what will occupy that space? In the, in the lot number two? As, as part of the approval for Z2, the only, the only really approved um, amenities that are in that area is just landscaping. And it would be accessible from the pathway that runs along what would be the northern, uh, eastern portions of that, because that is at grade and has um, a much, uh, it doesn't have as, as significant of a grade, so it's easier to access in terms of maintenance down the road. Okay, so that'll, that maintenance will be incumbent upon the owner of lot two. Correct. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to make sure is we weren't trying to save something for a vehicular access at some point being 15 feet wide and coming up to the building. To me, it sounded like I could get to a dumpster if I were a dump truck. But I didn't want to have an additional curb cut that close to North Riverview and, and North Street. So that's off the table. There will be no dumpster up by the building that is going to be accessed by some vehicle to be emptied via this route? Correct. As part of the approved plan, there is no vehicular access to this site. Um, and with lot one coming under city ownership as part of this, the frontage that you would have on at the intersection of North Riverview and North Street for lot two specifically, I don't think would be capable of holding a curb cut and would be a direct angled access into that intersection, which the city would would most so likely. logistically, how will they handle their refuse collection and things of that nature? I didn't, are they anticipating some sort of overhead door on North High Street or? No, I believe as we had discussions with them as well, and it would all be a private service pickup. They have a portion on the south side of the building um, that is accessible to a trash room within the building itself. And they'll have a private service that will come and collect from that portion. So there will be no dumpsters, overhead doors, or anything like that on the outside. Of the and they building. would collect to High Street then? Or which Correct. you said they're... Yes, they would collect along the south side of the building to High Street, I believe, is the intent. That's, the, that's where the direct access is. It'd be similar to what we did at the Bridge and High Building on, there between Tushies. And isn't there a doorway there for trash, an overhead door? And that's how they pick it they up. They have a roadway stub that comes in there that just comes off a high street. It's short. It's maybe 30 feet long, a stub of mm -hmm. sorts. But they're not going to have any stub. They're not going to have anything. Whatever refuge will be collected, no. they'll essentially, that there's not even, I don't believe there's parking spots on that piece of high street. So they'll just pull off to the side of the road. I believe there is uh, some designated parking directly in front of this one. Specifically, there is a loading zone. So the future tenants, as well as the, um, the trash service, would be able to use that loading zone during designated hours to collect refuse or um, to drop off materials. Because the two tenants that they have proposed for the ground story and the lower level are both restaurants. On the south side of the building, not, not 
Yes. On the high street side. Correct. Okay. Uh, just do we need to condition or add anything so that we preclude vehicular access from this portion in the in the rear or or do we have that covered under any other development agreements or something of that nature? I, initially, we have that covered under the approved uh, development plan that they have, the, the site plan review that they went through with the public review process. There was no um, vehicular access shown, so if they were to propose it, they would have to file and go through the, the, the appropriate public review process. Um, with regards to the development agreement, I don't know if there's any stipulations in that, but it would be covered or would require a separate approval and review for any vehicular access to the site. Okay, thank you. I agree, and as you're aware, many of you are aware, the same applicant also has the abutting property under contract on there, so how that gets impacted by what may be a larger development plan in the future. Uh, would I'm sure be looked at under that scenario, but under the development agreement with the developer They had the obligation to provide us with this plaza that was part of the land exchanges that were contemplated So we're getting this plaza land at no cost. This is actually significantly bigger than what was shown in our exhibit So we're pleased that uh, the amount of acreage we were able to get as part of this through this process So my question would be um, if they have the, the, the adjacent one under contract um, we're, they have to get access from the rear. You're not doing all of your, your delivery on that small front North High Street, are we? Where is the access? Is there any access on the east side? None at all. So, so trash, delivery, food trucks, everything's going to be on High Street? Correct. Every, everything would be accessed from High Street. For the, all the restaurants, for all the trash, for everybody on these on two and possibly the next building over? At least for two. It, for, the, for the property to the south, we can't speak without seeing some type of plan in place with that. But depending on how much land was involved with that, if it extended out to North Street, you would have the ability to use North Street and High Street. Um, but at this time, we can only speak for the Z2 building, which has that designated loading zone for, for these purposes. Well, I mean, it seems odd to me that with all the land we have back there, or what, with what there is, that we are using our, our front door to pick up trash um, and, and for food delivery and truck delivery. And it seems to me that we would want to. We screen our trash cans. Do we really want to want to pick up trash in the front? Is there no better way? I know we vacated. It looks like we vacated the alley here. I, I, and my understanding when it went through ARB is that they wanted this little strip because they saw it as possible development possibilities when, when and if they ever purchased the one next door. So, I mean, uh, it's hard enough to get down North High Street now. I hate to think that we have no access in the rear for these folks as they develop these properties. I don't know that that's a pattern we want to continue uh, towards North Street. We have two more parcels here that we're kind of setting the stage for if they, in fact, have those under contract. You know, I, you might have a single owner at a point in time, but they are independent. That's why this is platted. It's an individual plat. It could be held by any owner at any point in time that might not have a shared agreement, that might not, you know, have all of those same things. I just don't want us to create, um, you know, it, at least on the Bry High building, the trash doors and the entrance and egress of that trash is on the north side of that building. It is not facing High Street. It's kind of facing the, the short stub of an alley, if you will, mm -hmm. where, there, where those trucks can pull in and be serviced. Um, I, I think that's a pretty acceptable urban way to um, handle those materials. Um, you know, if we're going to have two more like this, where we're going to be dragging the trash across our uh, pave, new paver sidewalk, um, wouldn't that be an area to be, uh, that you'd get into with whatever kind of zoning get, takes place on the adjacent? Well, that's why my question was, the was, there any, was there any conversation at the Planning and Zoning Committee? And as much as they're common owners. I think part of what we're struggling with here is we're trying to go back and, I mean, this council and others approve the final development plans for these two projects on either side. And we're trying to think through exactly what provisions were made for those things. Since those projects are approved and under construction, we would do best just to bring the information back to you with regard to how they're serviced show you what's contemplated in terms of on-street or otherwise, and if there's other issues or other things we ought to explore, particularly as it relates to the future development of that, have a discussion about that. We'd be happy to do Would that. there be any kind of preliminary plans on the future development of the property just south that's in contract? Uh, 
Again, I don't. Any any thoughts at all about how you might be able to do a similar thing that we did at Bry High? It's a larger tract and it has access on two roads, so I think there's a lot more flexibility with that one. That could also serve as lot two? Conceivably. I mean, I think it makes it much more serviceable. Part of their interest, I think, in acquiring this additional real estate is it makes them much more logically developable, more serviceable. It sounds like it'd make the so planning a lot easier, the yeah. Plans, those things certainly For everybody. Be. But let us report back to you as to how precisely these are serviced today based on the approved development plan so you've got the, the best current information. And, I, you know, I've never seen a trash entrance and egress door on any building in year three that looked attractive. You know, it has a fresh coat of paint on the first year. On I don't think these have those kinds of service doors on them. But, again, let us, let us get the good information and bring it back to you so we're not speculating. Okay. So, so that doesn't impact what we do with this here? No. I just have one more, Logan, is that ARB asked for four different conditions, and one of them was the, uh, and, and maybe it's occurred, and that's difficult for me to tell it, uh, the, there was, um, well, maybe it's a moot point now because they own the other partial, or they will own the other partial, but the number four about inclusion of um, the partial ending in 4079 and 0027 from the property owner, but that's been apparently all the conditions that ARB placed on have been a correct taken yes. care of. and they've been verified with the building permits for the Z2 building okay thank you okay so with the additional information coming back from staff are there any other questions on this preliminary and final plat I have one question if we approve this and we find that there we don't have sufficient what, what do we do then well, we're limited in review of the plats. I mean, this is administrative. It's basically lot lines, easements. The development review, the look of the, has already been approved, and we can communicate that to you. If you have concerns, we can talk to Crawford Hoang and see if they would cooperate with us on something. Okay. When would we anticipate being able to get that information back, Terry? Like, how long would it take? Okay, well, I make a motion that we approve the preliminary and final plat for Building Z. Second. Ma'am. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Uh, Ms. Rosa. Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Vice Mayor Amorose Grooms? Yes. And Mr. Keenan? Yes. Okay, thank you. We'll revisit that issue in a couple of weeks. Staff comments, Dan? Nothing this evening, thank you. Council Committee reports, PNZ. Jane? Fresh off her maiden voyage, <laughs> six-hour maiden voyage of PNZ. A six-hour meeting. Yes, I was um, extremely pleased with um, with the dedication and the research that Planning and Zoning Commission members did. It was a interesting and long meeting, and uh, we'll just see what happens as we go forward. But thank you for that uh, baptism of fire, y'all. <laughs> we told you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Administrative Committee, Chris. Uh, thank you all for responding. Uh, our retreat, date, retreat dates are set, March 1st and 2nd, and um, I am going to be um, pursuing locations and things like that. Um, we'll, uh, we'll solidify this more via uh, email, and I'll distribute to you, but I, I think we're going to attempt to try something a little bit new this year uh, in a self-facilitation process. I am kind of excited about the possibility of doing this and how uh, we really might get to think bigger than, um, than we might think otherwise. Um, so I will send a detailed email out to all of you and ask you to chime in on those thoughts of our self-facilitation and what that might look like. Um, and uh, additionally, we have our planning and zoning reviews that will happen next week. Um, so excited to hear from our community members that applied for those, and um, we will be scheduling them and getting that material out to you. Uh, hopefully by the end of this week, we'll have all of that solidified with time frames and so on and so forth. So uh, with that, I have nothing further. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, community development, John? I think uh, I'm going to send uh, to you, Chris, and the rest of the members a series of items that are going to be related to community development that are going to appear at the annual meeting. We'll discuss them then. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thanks, John. Uh, Finance Committee, Mike. Nothing to report. Public Services Committee, Christina. Um, the Public Services Committee hasn't met for a couple of years, so I'm in the process of working on gathering what previous Public Service Committee meetings uh, have been prior to that. 
Um, so I've gone through the meeting minutes of the previous meetings and the agenda, and I'm working on um, putting a plan together to bring to you guys to take a look at and let me know what your feedback is um, about what this committee might address. Fantastic. Thank you. Staying with Christina, Dublin Friendship Association. Uh, we meet tomorrow. 7.30. How about that? See you there. Um, Morpsy, Chris? Uh, yes, we uh, met the week before last. Uh, I sent out some information about housing opportunities uh, that were available uh, through Morpsy programs. Uh, the State of the Region meeting will be April 19th. Um, that will be on our uh, City Council agenda, uh, calendar. Uh, also had a great presentation about the Soda Mile, and it was really exciting to see how that development is coming along. I learned a couple new things about that being a national veterans memorial, um, not just a state or city one, and they have received national um, the designation for the National Veterans Memorial. So that's going to be a really exciting thing for our region. Uh, and they have done an excellent job at facilitating that. Um, uh, but it was, it was a great meeting, and I'll try to bring back as much information as I can on a timely basis. Thank you. Great. Uh, Logan Union, Champaign County Regional Planning Commission. Kathy? Kathy, to report. How about the U.S. 33 Innovation Corridor Group? I think we meet next month. Okay. Dublin Arts Council, John. Let's see, uh, I think during our next meeting, I or Dave Guyon will give you the quarterly report. We passed a number of years ago a resolution that uh, there'd be a quarterly meeting uh, with the city staff members and the Dublin Arts Council and the representative. So you can look forward to a whole bunch of new and interesting things that are going to be coming out of the Arts Council. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, Board of Education, Christina. Um, so congratulations to um, Scott Melody for he's now the president, president although the Lynn continues her leadership as vice president and our next meeting is February 7th. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Washington Township, uh, Eric, chief, fantastic work. You guys got anything to add? You know, that the presentation earlier is an example of what we get when we work together. So fantastic efforts. Thank you. Uh, Council Roundtable. Jane? Uh, Kathy and I attended the uh, Martin Luther King dinner. It was um, really an amazing, an amazing evening. Um, I know Kathy's going to speak to it too, but um, it was uh, the way they had us sit at a table of 10 with uh, a diverse person at, with a different color about a different diversity, whether it was age and gender or ethnicity or race or whatever. Um, we met some wonderful people, but I came to understand that... Um, that prejudices exist everywhere, and they exist in Dublin too, and we, it doesn't necessarily fall under race necessarily, as it also falls under absolutely every person has something about them that you could probably find that you don't like. <laughs> but um, prejudices are, um, are learned behaviors, so we as a community hopefully will teach our children to view everyone equally, and that we will take every opportunity to bring empathy and understanding to everybody we come across. And so I was very proud of our, of our evening. Um, then the other thing I wanted to bring up is that I attended the uh, Franz uh, Metro uh, Dublin Area Plan meeting on Wednesday. We had almost 100 residents show up. A great presentation by staff. I know that there were some uh, tough moments, and I think that we just need to continue to uh, increase communication with our residents and make sure that we have really good one-on-one -on -one personal uh, discussions. And um, you already know about PNC, so that's it. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Kathy. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, along with several members here on council, were uh, present at the, um, su the supper, the Martin Luther King supper. A um, well, couple things that really struck me was that about a third of the folks there, were, and there were a lot of folks there, were students and young people. And I was incredibly impressed with how um, they not only participated, but quite often led a lot of these discussions, which aren't always easy discussions for any of us at any age. And it was very impressive. And so I want to congratulate the folks that put that together and everybody attended. It was nice. Um, the other thing that struck me is um, just how nice it is sometimes to sit around a table and just have supper with people that you don't know. 
that that's kind of a lost art in all of the meetings and activities. It's kind of like a citywide block party. Um, and it struck me that those can be very powerful um, and very simple moments, and we should figure out ways to do that more often because I thought that was terrific. So my thanks to that group. Um, as Jane mentioned, she and I um, were at the Dublin Corporate Area Plan meeting. Um, and for those that aren't necessarily familiar with that, this is one of, I think, the third in a series where the community had an opportunity to talk about and give input into what is a 25 to 50 year vision of what these areas might look like. Um, as Jane said, it was quite a robust discussion at, at times. Um, and a couple, I think, very important things came out of that. And that is because there is so much happening at Dublin, this isn't the only area plan that's under discussion that it's incredibly important that we take the opportunity when we're doing the long-term planning to find ways to continue to have meetings like this one to increase the input, um, to listen to the concerns and the insights in that planning process. Because the, as the evening went on, it became um, very interesting to see how folks wanted to share their input and what we need to do as a community to take that forward. Um, because, again, there's so much going on, I think it's also important that we continue to find ways to share information, timing of those meetings, where those meetings are going to be about, what expected to happen at those meetings, input that people can have. Um, so I applaud that, and it was, it was a very nice way to spend uh, really our first, uh, our first week as part of council, um, and just how important it is to come together as a community to do that. So I know how much hard work and planning that is, but it really pays off. The community plans only get better if we continue to find ways to, to, to do that with the community. So I thank you for that. And sort of one last observation from a new council member. Um, as you may have recalled at the December 4th council meeting, a new um, Dublin Rec Center inter and interactive display was unveiled uh, out in the back here. Um, for those of you that miss it, it's sort of an interactive chalkboard, I guess I'd call it. Um, it is installed at the rec center and uh, over the holidays, and I can share firsthand because I go there quite a bit that it's been used a lot. Um, residents are presented with some questions like, what planning do you do? What programming do you do at the rec center? What would you like to see happen? And I thought it'd be fun. I was at the rec center early this morning and stopped by to see, as I normally do now, what folks are putting on that board. And the question of the day I thought was really interesting, and it said, if you were mayor of Dublin for the day, what would you do? So, Mayor Peterson, if you want to take a few notes. I'm writing. All right. So here's, here's what people said that if they were mayor, what they would do for the day. Um, I'd help people. I'd eat cookies and brownies and drink chocolate milk. Deal. Always a good advice. Um, I would make the city a smart city with free internet. I'm assuming for all is what that meant. You can pause there. Um, plant flowers. Ask the mayor to drive rotaries, construction, and traffic for a solid day. Promote the best worker that I saw on that day. <laughs> Take an employee out to lunch and post a picture for all to see. And what I think is probably the, would, would be the crowd favorite, make every day Irish Fest Day. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, you should put those there on your the calendar. That, that's all. Well Thank done. you. John? Mike? Uh, just a couple quick. If I were mayor for the day, I'd stay in bed, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> Um, You've been there. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Um, the sewer project, could you give us an update next week on uh, our deal over at the massive roundabout coming out of the hotel? Looks like it's about done or is done or did, just, just an update. I don't need We'll it. get you an update, yep. Okay. And secondly, uh, Megan, how are we doing with salt? Good? Okay. That's all I have. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Christina? Best answer all night. <laughs> Um, just a couple of things just to piggyback on what um, Jane and Kathy were saying about the Sunday supper. It was really nice. And I think one of the things that Christine Nardecchia said was that it was a great size. Um, and rather than see it be bigger, it would be great to do those types of community events more often. Um, and you don't need a big event to have a community Sunday supper type of a situation. Um, and it was, it was really fun. Um, um, I actually met with a couple of residents this past weekend um, that are um, about in the same age group as my parents are. And um, 
Yeah, I know, Greg, this is something that you've talked about as well, is aging in place. Um, and she brought to my attention, um, she said she has been to every single suburb of Columbus um, and been to every senior center in each of the suburbs of Columbus and brought me a stack of material almost as thick as our council notebooks. <laughs> um, and so this is a topic that I think is, is very poignant and very timely and very close to my heart um, with, with my parents being in that age group. Um, but it was wonderful to see how much homework she did for me, I guess, um, and to have some additional conversations. And I know we've talked about talking about it at goal setting and, and some other things. But it may be something that, um, you know, for my new committee, it's an old committee, but my new committee that, that I might want to tackle in that committee. So I just wanted to bring that something for you guys to think about and chew on. I don't need to, we don't need to have discussion about it tonight. Um, but it is really important to me. Um, other than that, that's all I have. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Chris? I, too, would like to uh, thank the Dublin Teen Corps for the uh, Sunday supper. It, they really did a great job. And I, I tell you that we had, um, my husband and I went, and we had three um, high school young people at our table, and they were beyond impressive. Actually, one of the high school gals was our table facilitator, so not only did she come to participate in the conversation, she was willing to lead it. That was uh, extraordinarily impressive. Um, and uh, went to the Dublin uh, Women in Business luncheon, as Kathy did on the 17th, and uh, continued to be impressed by the business women in this community and their desire to uh, do all they can to make it the best community possible. So that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I got a letter that I want to, it's short, but I want to read this to you real quick. Um, it is from a la lady by the name of Janet Seeds, and it says, I am one of the nieces of George L. Seeds. I worked with Alex Rosansky to document my Uncle George's service in World War II and his killed in action status. Alex sent me a photo of the Dublin Cemetery KIA Memorial and the addition of my uncle's name. I now live 600 miles from Dublin, but I watched the live October 9th City Council meeting online. I held my breath during your vote, and I had a good cry afterwards. The last time I was in Ohio, I saw the KIA Memorial, and it was beautiful. On behalf of everyone in the Seeds family, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for approving the addition of George's name to the memorial. Happy New Year to you and to yours with great gratitude. Janet Seeds. So um, that just struck me and it reminded me we've got leaders here, John and Mike and Dana, that remind us of our veterans and, and the sacrifices that they made. And this is, you know, this is a very small thing for us to do, but to the Seeds family, it was an overwhelming gesture and they deserve every ounce of that recognition and honor. And so I appreciate what our veterans do for us and I appreciate our staff that reminds us we need to acknowledge that as often as we can. So um, with that, uh, be no further business before this body, we are adjourned. <laughs>